Hi everyone. So, not long to go now until Formula 1's back on our screens. Every off-season just feels endless, doesn't it? This one has actually been one of the shorter ones, especially compared to last year. <laughs> but now, life is slowly returning to normal. Large-scale vaccination programmes are in place in countries across the world, so hopefully this year we may return to a more typical Formula 1 season and be allowed to attend races again. So first, let's look at the race calendar. This is a pretty packed calendar, which I'll be honest is quite risky, since there will undoubtedly be disruptions caused by the virus at some point. But for the time being, this is a pretty typical Formula 1 race calendar, but there are some interesting additions. We're starting at Bahrain for only the third time in history. Fair enough. Next up is Imola. This, of course, made its return last year after a 14-year absence. It's a brilliant, iconic circuit, which is memorable for a mixture of both good and bad reasons. Last year's race was okay, but the circuit is not particularly well suited to modern cars, but clearly the FIA have listened to fans who wanted to see the return of the interim races that were run last year, even though Istanbul or Nürburgring would have been better choices, I think. After this we were supposed to have the Chinese Grand Prix, but due to the pandemic it's been dropped. I'm going to do a separate video looking at my perfect F1 calendar and why we shouldn't race there anymore anyway, but for now it's been replaced with Portimao. Good choice. I mean, Portimao is a fantastic modern circuit that's completely hermitilk free, so it has elevation changes and corners that flow well and doesn't look like an oversized stadium. The first few laps last year were mad, but the rest of the race was a little dull, but the cars look great driving around it, so it'll be good to see it again. Next up is Spain. Uh, we shouldn't be racing here anymore. It's fine for testing, but the races suck. I understand there's demand to have a Spanish Grand Prix, what with two Spanish drivers on the grid, but maybe we should return to Jerez, or possibly try and resurrect the Valencia circuit? Then it's Monaco, fair enough. Baku after that, I mean, the races kind of go one way or the other, but if it was dropped I wouldn't miss it. Then Canada, fair enough. Then Paul Ricard, not fair enough. Um, there are definitely better circuits in France to race on. Austria, Silverstone, Hungary, all good. The British Grand Prix takes place after the UK government's proposed date to remove all social distancing restrictions, so hopefully this one can be run with spectators. Then it's the summer break, then we have Spa, Zandvoort and Monza in consecutive weekends. Zandvoort's going to be mad, especially if the Dutch government allows spectators. The circuit feels like a roller coaster with the insane cambering and banking on it. If Max wins here in front of the Orange Army, it'll be out of this world. Then it's Sochi, which needs to go. Then Singapore and Tezuka, fair enough. Then Kota and Mexico, fair enough. Then into Lagos, which actually looked in jeopardy for a bit with the new proposed circuit in Rio, but it's staying. Although once again, it's not the season finale, which it should be permanently, I'll be honest. Then it's Australia. Uh, they've been clever in postponing this to another fixed date rather than cancelling it completely, because obviously the COVID situation in Victoria is still pretty precarious. I'm not old enough to remember when the Australian Grand Prix used to be at the end of the season rather than the beginning, so that'll be a little strange. Maybe hosting it in November instead of March will affect the possibility of rain? Um, it'll be mid-spring rather than late summer, so maybe. Then we end in the Middle East again, but this time we have Saudi Arabia. Herman Tilker is designing a flash new circuit to polish the turd that is the House of Saud. I don't care what the circuit's like, it'll be the usual flat car park with constant 90 degree turns, but it'll be surrounded by all these high-rise buildings and posh resorts in the middle of the desert, because that's what we want as racing fans, obviously. There should be no discussions about the legitimacy of racing here, and hopefully Hamilton can walk the walk and not just talk the talk and lead a movement to boycott the race. As well as this, there was a bit of a scare with a missile intercepted over Riyadh during the Formula E round there in February. Um, Apparently this happens all the time, which I don't exactly think that makes that better, but as well as this being a country F1 shouldn't race in in general, um, it also has the potential to pose a major safety and security risk to all F1 personnel. Then we end at Yas Marina. Again, we shouldn't still be racing here. 2010 and 2016 were good because they had title deciders that went all the way to the last lap, and 2012 was alright because Vessel climbed from last to third. But as good as the circuit looks, the racing is just completely absent, and it's in another country with no racing heritage or fan base, but lots of money. Hopefully it goes soon, but I'm not holding my breath. So we have a record-breaking 23 race calendar. I'm all for having lots of races, but this puts a strain on the teams, especially with back-to-back -back flyaway races, and a lot of the races here are ones we don't need anyway and can be replaced with something much better. 
rule changes are fairly minor this year because originally the new quasi ground effect cars were being introduced but that's been postponed until 2022 so for now all the teams are running modified versions of last year's cars which have all had to have revised floors that now taper towards the rear axis in order to reduce downforce which should slow them down a bit a budget cap of $145 million has been brought in for the year as well, partly to help teams financially because of the pandemic, but also to even the grid out a bit, as Mercedes spend far more than everyone else and have been virtually untouchable for the past seven years. With all that out of the way, let's look at who's actually racing this year, shall we? So first up are the defending champions Mercedes, fielding as ever defending champion Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas, with Nick de Vries and Stoffel van Dorn as reserve drivers for the year. There's a new rule this year that every team must run a drive with fewer than two race starts during FP1 at least once during the season. Um, De Vries has no starts to his name, so he's the obvious choice. Another possible but less realistic option is Frederick Vesti, who is a Mercedes junior driver currently in Formula 3. Mercedes teased us a lot regarding Hamilton's future with the team over the winter, but there were never any doubts he'd be racing for them this year. They're still producing the best cars, and Hamilton hasn't exactly lost his touch, so there's no reason for him to go. That being said, this is probably going to be his final year in the sport. He signed a one-year contract, and he's going to cruise his way to title number eight and break the 100 win barrier, most likely. When the new rule changes come in, there's no guarantee Mercedes will still be on top, so he may as well end on a high. He's got plenty of passions and interests outside of Formula 1 to pursue, so he's got plenty to keep himself occupied in with his retirement. And then we have Bottas. I'm rapidly running out of patience with him. I'd be less fed up if he didn't keep claiming that he can fight for titles at the start of each season, because he clearly can't. The team give him plenty of chances, but as well as not being as fast as Hamilton, he tends to bear most of the reliability troubles and bad luck. It would take a miracle for him to beat Hamilton this year, because on pure pace it's just not going to happen. And so, for me, the sooner George is in that car, the better. As for the car, I mean, relatively little's changed because of the rules, and to be honest, there's not much you want to change on a car as dominant as that. Uh, the livery is slightly worse now that the engine cover is plastered in AMG stickers. Uh, one thing that does appear to have changed, however, is the handling. Pre-season testing was not good for Mercedes. As well as gearbox problems, the car just looked harder to drive and Hamilton spun several times. The team were fairly open about this, however, which leads me to think that they're simply exaggerating the issues and playing mind games with the other teams. But, I mean, I guess we'll see in Bahrain. Next is the only other front-running team, Red Bull, who've kept Max Verstappen and have dropped Alex Alba for Sergio Perez. Yuri Vips, Liam Lawson and Jane Deruvela are all Red Bull junior drivers in Formula 2, so expect to see one of them in the car in FP1 this year. It's probably just wishful thinking, but there is definitely a feeling among F1 fans that Red Bull will provide a proper challenge to Mercedes this year. Red Bull ended last year on top, however, I'm not convinced that Mercedes Abu Dhabi place was genuine. To be comfortably plastist all year and then lose by 20 seconds in the final race, I mean, they won both championships already so there was no need to push the cars or the engines. Max drives the socks off the car and spent basically all of last year staring at the Mercedes diffusers. This is his seventh season in Formula 1. A driver of his calibre should be champion by now, which shows you just how dominant Mercedes have been. Red Bull have been very secretive with the car, so hopefully they pull something out of the bag that can top on Mercedes, because if they have a car that's fast enough, I think Max could just walk it. One thing that should help them in the Constructors' Championship at least is their new second driver, Sergio Perez. The second Red Bull seat has been cursed for several years now. Both the team and the car are built around Verstappen, which means the car has tailored his very aggressive driving style and was clearly very difficult for Pierre Gasly and Alex Albon to control. Perez is much more experienced than they are, but if he has all the same problems as them, then it will be clear the car is the problem. All he has to do is finish fourth every race, really. It's unlikely he'll be beating for Verstappen that often, even if the team allowed it, but he should be a good wingman in the fight against Mercedes. The third team is McLaren, running Daniel Ricciardo and Lando Norris. Uh, despite looking basically the same as last year, this is the only car this year that is fundamentally different, as there is now a Mercedes power unit in the back instead of a Honda power unit. So we're now back to the glory days of McLaren Mercedes. I'm not entirely sure who they might run in FP1 this year. They don't have an academy or a junior program. Will Stevens and Oliver Turvey are their simulator and development drivers. Um, Stevens has already raced in Formula 1 and Turvey is not exactly a young rookie. But as a Mercedes customer team, maybe De Vries or Vesti will get loaned out to them. Ricardo's slowly climbing his way back up to the front of the grid. Um, a lot of people seem to want him to win a race this year or think he can do it. Uh, in normal conditions, no, but if we get any crazy mixed-up races, I don't see why not. Uh, Lando last lap Norris had a very good year last year. 
I don't think he can beat Ricardo, but he should be even more competitive than last year and seems to fit perfectly within the team as well. Next up is the new Aston Martin team featuring Lance Stroll and Sebastian Vettel. Uh, the money being pumped in by Lawrence Stroll is clearly paying off as they really mean business this year. It was a huge kick in the crotch last year to see Perez dropped in favour of Stroll, especially as Perez single-handedly saved the team from collapse back in 2018. Uh, but now that Perez has essentially been given a promotion, all is forgiven. Last year's car was basically a carbon copy of the 2019 Mercedes, so it was hardly a surprise that it was their most competitive year. This car looks brand new with the fresh British Racing Green paint job, but it's the same basic car with a few minor modifications. So, to me, they should be able to take third in the Constructors this year outright, without having points deducted for using Mercedes components, but not actually being required to remove said components, which was a bit of a strange penalty, to be honest. Stroll is getting into a rhythm now, beginning to prove himself worthy of that seat, even if his dad basically bought the seat and the entire team for him. He, f he got his first pole position last year and almost won his first race. He needs plenty of crazy safety car races, because that's where he really shines. And then we get to Vessel. I've always been a massive Vettel fan, and I really hope this new environment works for him. It's his first time driving a Mercedes-powered car, and compared to the rather uncompromising Ferrari, this should suit his driving style more. Most of last year was pretty awful, but there were the odd moments, particularly at Turkey where he showed he hasn't lost his touch just yet. It would be great to see him win a race, but we'll have to see, I guess. The team had reliability issues in pre-season testing, mostly with the gearbox, um, but hopefully that doesn't hinder them too much. Another new-ish team is next, Alpine, featuring Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon. Alonso's back, which is interesting. Um, it hasn't been the smoothest of returns, though, as of course a few weeks ago he broke his jaw in a cycling accident and now has two metal plates embedded in his face. Um, it's not the first time he's been injured before the season start, but he got through testing and he seems to be determined to race at Bahrain anyway. He's now 39, so he's no spring chicken. Uh, Schumacher came out of retirement after three years, age 41, and did not impress. It's been two and a half years since Alonso's retirement. He's two years younger, and he's been actively racing in other series that time, so he's definitely fresher, but he has ambitions of winning the title again with his former team, and that really is a tall order. I can picture this being a frustrating year for him in the upper midfield that just leads him to retire again when things don't go his way. And to be honest, there are a lot of young drivers in the academy that want that seat, so I think they should take priority. Those drivers include Oscar Piastri, Guan Yu Zhou, Victor Martin and Caio Collette, any of which would be eligible to drive an FP1 this year. Alongside Alonso is Esteban Ocon. Uh, he spent only one year out of the sport and really was fairly underwhelming last year, so that gives an idea of what we may see from Alonso. Ocon's second place at Bahrain last year was the main highlight of his return, but Maybe now with a whole year under his belt, he'll return to the form we saw from him at Racing Point, but hopefully without the crashes. In terms of management, uh, Cyril Abitable is out and Davide Brivio is in. Uh, the car itself looks very pretty in that shimmering alpine blue, and it has a very chunky engine cover, but I guess it remains to be seen if that helps them at all in the midfield battle. Then it's everyone's favourite team, Ferrari! Uh, Charles Leclerc has stayed with the team, probably long term, and Vettel has been replaced by Carlos Sainz. Callum Eilert is their reserve driver for the year, so he's the obvious choice for FP1 running, but Academy drivers Robert Schwartzman, Marcus Armstrong and Artur Leclerc are all other possible options. They've got some serious work to get them out of the hole they've dug in the past few years. One solution apparently has been to drop Vettel. Um, the engine is seriously underpowered now that they're not allowed to run illegal fuel maps, and apparently the aero isn't brilliant if Vettel struggles or anything to go by. Leclerc really outdrove the car last year, and I have no doubts he will again this year. Uh, Sainz signed with the team before the first race last year, so God only knows what he was thinking once he saw the true pace of the car. This is a lose-lose situation for him. A worse car and a team that will not let him challenge their number one on equal footing. The car itself seems to have been fine in testing, even with that big fluorescent green W on the engine cover. Um, the midfield teams ahead of them are going to be really close, but generally I don't expect Ferrari to keep up with them. Next up is Alpha Tauri, who are fielding Pierre Gasly once again and rookie Yuki Tsunoda. For me, Gasly was the real star of last year. He was back to his best after his demotion from Red Bull, and obviously his win came in very strange circumstances, but that was a very special weekend. He's not going to be going back to Red Bull anytime soon, I hope at least, and to be honest, he may as well stay with AlphaTauri for the foreseeable future. The car isn't the most competitive, but he seems to really work well with the team. He won't be winning any championships anytime soon, but he can at least say that he's a Grand Prix winner now. 
From next year, AlphaTauri, like Red Bull, continues to use Honda Power despite Honda leaving the sport. This, however, has not stopped them signing their new Honda back rookie, Yuki Tsunoda. He's a very exciting prospect. Uh, he's had a meteoric rise through the ranks. He finished third in Formula 2 last year despite failing to score almost half the races. He's got some serious pace, but he does crash a lot. There seems to be an understanding and an expectation that there will be mistakes and errors in his rookie year, but that he will make up for that with his speed and maturity as well. It's also great to have a Japanese driver on the grid. We haven't had one since Kamui Kobayashi in 2014, and Japan is a key market for Formula 1 as the only major non-Western motoring nation involved in the sport. The car itself has had what last year was a real standout livery, overshadowed somewhat by a lot of the other ones. Um, the car itself looks basically the same as last year, and I'm not expecting them to have moved much up the grid. Moving to the back markers, first up is Alfa Romeo, who have Kimi Raikkonen and Antonio Giovinazzi, and then Robert Kubica as a reserve driver. This is the team I'm least excited about. Um, Kimi is now the most experienced driver in F1 history, and also the oldest on the grid. Somehow he's still going, despite not having given a single about anything since about 2005. Um, he's not as fast as he was, but he still has a lot of experience to bring to the team, which I suppose is why they're going to keep him on, especially if he's still happy to do it, because, you know, for him it's just a hobby. Uh, Giovinazzi is just meh. I mean, I've got nothing against him personally, and he's not a terrible driver, but he's also not great. To me, he's in kind of the same league as Marcus Ericsson, and as a Ferrari customer team, there are several Ferrari Academy drivers on the doorstep waiting to take that seat from him. So this could well be his last year. The car was unveiled at an extremely Italian launch ceremony, and it does look very pretty with the reversed colours from last year. Alfa Romeo have been hovering between the lower two quadrants of the grid for several years now, and I don't think that's going to change for the time being. And then we get to Haas. Oh dear. Haas are attempting a fresh start, again, with two new drivers and a new title sponsor, but needless to say, that has not gone well. First up is Mick Schumacher. Unsurprisingly, with that name, he's generated a great deal of interest, which only increased after he won the Formula 2 championship last year. You can pretty much guarantee he's going to end up in a Ferrari eventually, but he's going to have his work cut out for him in this team, especially with all the negative publicity being generated by his new teammate. So, let's talk about Nikita Mazepin. His father, Dimitri, is a major shareholder in chemical giant Eurocali, who, surprise surprise, are Haas's new title sponsor. As drivers go, he's not the worst. I mean, his main issue seems to be his lack of disregard for other drivers, both on and off track. However, that's got nothing on his conduct on social media. He's made inappropriate sexual advances towards women on Snapchat, and during a live feed by George Russell on Instagram, hinted that George was gay? Um, then, in November last year, he posted a video to his Instagram story where he grabs a girl's breasts in the backseat of a car who then bats his hands away and gives him the middle finger. Needless to say, this was not received well. Uh, he posted a very scripted apology that probably wasn't written by him, which was then deleted. Uh, the girl in the video, a model named Andrea Duval, then contradicted this by coming to his defence, saying that they're friends and it was a joke. A week later, she then contradicted herself by posting vague statements about protecting drunk women and not letting men take advantage of you, then the so-called friends unfollowed each other. All of this spawned the hashtag we say no to Mazepin, which shows no signs of abating as he has not lost his seat. Haas are in a dire financial situation and the only reason they're still here is because Dimitri has pumped a huge amount of money into the team to have his son race for them, which brings me to the car. This extremely American team is running an extremely Russian livery, which is interesting, as those aren't even Eurocali's colours. If they had used Eurocali's colours, it would have ended up looking like a Bulgarian flag. On an aesthetic level, it does actually look quite good, but the message here is plain and clear to see. There's a universal ban on Russian athletes competing under the Russian flag in their respective sports due to all the doping scandals that have happened, and this looks like a cheap way around that, as it's the colours of the Russian flag, but the proportions are off just enough to make it different. It's also a bit of a kick in the crotch to American fans and investors. I mean, not that there are many of the latter, as no one wants to go to any of the team anymore. This is supposed to be an American team, and this car is just one big tribute to a Russian mogul and his spoiled brat of a son. They've also said they're not developing the car at all this year in preparation for 2022. So if it's not the slowest at the start of the year, it definitely will be at the end. That being said, they did clock in a lot of mileage in pre-season testing without any major problems, so that should help them a little bit. 
And last, but certainly not least, is Williams, who are fielding George Russell and Nicholas Latifi. Roy Nassani and Jack Aitken are their two reserve drivers for the year, and they also had Jamie Chadwick as their simulator and development driver. Nissani and Aitken have both driven the car several times, including a race for Aitken in place of Russell, and Nissani did the entire first day of pre-season testing on his own, so we'll be seeing them in the car this year for sure. George doesn't deserve to still be in that seat. He's proved what a star he is in his one race for Mercedes last year that obviously didn't go his way. He has nothing left to prove in this car, and it just seems to be somewhere to hold him until Hamilton or Bottas leaves Mercedes. He might get a point this year at last, but he's going to spend basically the entire year in the bottom half of the field. As for Latifi, I've got nothing against the guy. He's another billionaire pay driver like Stroll and Mazepin, but he gets by far the least criticism as he doesn't flaunt his wealth, and he's also sat in the least desirable seat on the grid. He's the slowest guy in the field for sure, but one thing I will give him over George is that he does seem to be more opportunistic and better at putting himself in advantageous positions during safety car races. Overall though, he's just fairly average. This is Williams in name only, as the Williams family sold the team last year to Doralton Capital. This much needed money should hopefully get them out of the hole they've dug in the past five years. 2019 was a real low point in particular, and they've been gradually improving since then. Doralton Capital have said they want to preserve the Williams name and legacy, starting with this rather zany new livery, which is supposed to be a homage to the iconic Cannon and Rothmans liveries of the 90s, despite looking like neither of them. The renders looked awful, and it looked like a stock livery from the F1 games, but on track it does actually look quite good. Pre-season testing went fairly smooth for them as well, so yeah, we'll just have to see how things go. In terms of predictions for the year, I think things will have closed up, particularly in the midfield. Based on pre-season testing, there's every reason to believe that Red Bull will be fastest out the starting blocks, which would be nice as they tend to have fairly weak starts to the season. However, if they are fastest at any point, Mercedes are more than capable of overcoming that. In the midfield, it's anyone's guess with Aston Martin, McLaren and Alpine. It's a really interesting mix of drivers with two former champions and some young blood as well. It'll be a good battle for third, but I seriously doubt any of them will fish higher than that. Ferrari and AlphaTauri will be having their own little battle in the lower midfield with possibly the old podium here and there. Um, not much will have changed at the back, other than Alfa Romeo and Williams slowly pulling away from Haas and out of fire range of Mazepin. If I was going to make a prediction of how the final driver's standings will look, uh, in ascending order it would go something like this. Latifi will be last and consistently the slowest driver. Mazepin will be 19th after a difficult year that will mostly be self-inflicted, assuming he even lasts the year, as Gunther may be forced to fire him if he commits any more major infractions and the PR gets really bad. Then it'll be Schumacher in 18th after a decent year of it, just in a slow car. Russell will be next and just might scrape a point or two. Uh, Giovinazzi will be 16th. It'll be mostly a quiet year, but there may be the odd Q3 appearance and points finish. And then Raikkonen will drive his way indifferently to 15th. Sunoda will score points here and there, but will also make a few costly mistakes to finish 14th. Um, Gasly will be nice and solid. Another remarkable win is unlikely, but hopefully he'll be a good mentor to Sunoda. Ocon will be outpaced by Alonso and squeezed out of a lot of the midfield battles to finish in 12th. Sainz will be stuck in a difficult pla, playing supporting role to Leclerc to finish 11th with semi-regular points grabs. Lando Norris is going to be strong, but the midfield is so close that I think he'll end up 10th in the championship. Leclerc is going to outdrive the car once again. There will be a couple of podiums and maybe a win. Alonso is going to give it his all as he always does, but his age will catch up with him to give him 8th in the championship. Uh, Lance Stroll will excel in the wet races and the crazy ones, but in the regular races will struggle a bit to finish 7th in the championship. Ricardo is going to have a great time in that McLaren. There'll definitely be some podiums and potentially a win. Vettel's going to refine his mojo and win the midfield battles to finish 5th in the championship. Perez will dutifully fulfil his wingman role at Red Bull with regular top 4 finishes to finish 4th in the championship. Bottas will do his usual thing of scuppering race starts and then destroying his tyres. If he does win any races, it'll be ones where Hamilton either doesn't finish or gets penalised for whatever reason. Couple this with his general bad luck and Gremlins under the engine and he'll finish third in the championship. Verstappen will be right up though with Hamilton and things will definitely be close to Mercedes, but there are still a few things that Red Bull need to iron out before he can become champion, I think. Which means Hamilton will win his eighth championship and then walk away from Formula 1. 
Hopefully this year he'll have to work a bit harder for it, but if Max really starts to push him, he will definitely step it up and make sure that he's not beaten. So yeah, less than two weeks to go now, so lights out in Bahrain. It remains to be seen how much of what I've predicted comes true, but like everyone else, I just cannot wait for us to get going again. So that's all for this video. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter at Brook underscore F1 and I'll see you all next time.